Well, God bless you. Welcome to our channel. I believe God brought you here today because God has a word for you. You're not here by mistake. You're here by the divine providence of God because God brought you here because God has a message that will change your life. So right now, open your ears, open your mind, open your heart and receive this wonderful word from God. Amen. Listen, I'm excited to be picking up where we left off in the series of sermons we've been preaching and teaching together under the general rubric of moving forward. Listen, I want you to know, I believe God is doing something with us. I believe God is doing something with us, in us, and through us. That God is trying to move us forward into new things. But to move forward, you've got to move out of what was and into what will be and what can be. That means you've got to get over inertia. Inertia is the, the force that wants you to sit still and stay still or keep going in the same direction. We've got to make some moves so that we can truly move forward. And this week, as we're moving forward, I want you to know that moving forward will require something of you that many times we forget. Moving forward will require gratitude from you. It will require gratitude from you. Listen, join me in the Gospel according to St. Luke. And I want to read for your hearing today from St. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Listen to what God's word says. Now on his way to Jerusalem... Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When, they, when he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were there not all 10 who were cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. God, we thank you because we know that you're moving us forward. But God, because you're moving us forward, we know that we need to get ready. So God, right now, we ask you to open our ears so that we may hear. Open our minds so that we may understand. But open our hearts so that we may receive. God, we came for a word from you. So God, enliven us. God, impart into us. And God, help us to move on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, everybody, this week I want to entitle this sermon very simply, Moving Forward forward in gratitude. But I want to give it a subtitle, Access Granted. Access Granted. I, I noticed something as I was preparing for this sermon. One of the things that I love about God, one of the things that I love about the stories of Jesus and how Jesus lived when he was on earth is that we serve a God who makes stops. You ever notice that people just are busy in the world sometimes? People are always going here, there, and everywhere. We have schedules that we're trying to maintain. We have places we're trying to be, people we're trying to see, things we're trying to do, places we've got to go. And if we're honest, many times we're in a hurry. Many times we're breaking speed limits on the highway because we're in a hurry. We're running yellow lights because we're in a hurry. We're making right turns on red when there's somebody in the crosswalk because we're in a hurry. We live in a world. <clears throat> where we almost live as if we're going to run out of time if we don't get there quickly enough. But I have always been amazed that as I watch Jesus, as I watch the stories of Jesus in the Bible, Jesus, no matter where he was going, Jesus was always caring enough that he would stop what he was doing to deal with the cries of people. He would stop what he was doing whenever there was a problem going on. If you, if you go through the scriptures, you will find that when Jesus performed miracles, he was typically doing something else before he stopped to perform the miracle. When, when, he, when he performs his first miracle, when he turns water into wine in the, in the uh, wedding at Cana of Galilee, uh, Jesus is partying. He's at the reception. He's kicking it with the boys. When his mother stops him and says, they've got a problem and I need you to fix it. He stopped for his disciples. He stopped sleeping in the bottom of the boat. When the disciples ran into a storm on the sea and they were afraid, do you not care if we perish? They had to go wake Jesus up. 
in the middle of the storm. He stopped sleeping to help his, to help his disciples. He stopped for blind Bartimaeus. Jesus walking from one side of town to the other. And Bartimaeus is crying out on the roadside. And Jesus stops long enough to hear his problem, call him over, and grant him a miracle. He stopped dying on the, on the cross to let a thief go into paradise. Jesus will stop if you call on him. And I want to ask somebody today, when is the last time you actually called on Jesus? I don't mean when's the last time you put up a prayer. I don't mean when's the last time you just humbly ask. I mean when's the last time you really called on Jesus? When was the last time you shouted his name? When is the last time you went out of your way to get God's attention? When was the last time you really needed to get the Lord's attention and you did whatever it would take to get God to listen to you? Many of us are missing out on blessings because we are busy being shy. We don't want to make a scene. We don't want to cause a stir. We don't want people to know what we're going through. So we suffer in silence and try to go, psst, Jesus, psst, over here, Jesus, psst. And it's not that Jesus doesn't hear you. But here's the thing. When it gets bad enough, when you've gone through enough, when you felt enough pain, you will get to the point where you make the decision. I'm going to holler till he hears me. I'm going to yell. I'm going to scream. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to raise my voice. I'm going to do whatever it takes because I need him to stop. Listen, if you're going through right now, I need you to type it in the comments. Jesus, stop. Don't stop what you're doing. Just stop by here. Jesus, stop and listen to me. Jesus, stop and see what I'm going through. Because this is what I love about God. If you call out, he will stop on your behalf. This was the case for these 10 lepers that we find in the gospel according to Luke. There are 10 lepers between that who are in this no man's land. They're living outside of, outside of Galilee, outside of Samaria. They're in no man's land. Because of their condition, they can't be in Galilee because they have to stay outside the city. They can't be in Samaria because they've got a, they've got a disease that's highly contagious. So they're living in this no man's land. You ever realize that your condition can put you between places, between heaven and hell, between home and away, between friend and foe, between family and enemy. When you're in a condition, you can wind up between stuff just trying to make it, between stuff just having to survive, between stuff on the outside looking in, or between stuff trying to figure out what's going on over there and figure out what's going on over there, but not belonging in any of these places. But here's the thing, they had created community around their affliction. Because they were between stuff, here's the thing, there are always people who can come together in their brokenness. There are always people who can come together in and around their suffering. So you find these 10 lepers that are in between Samaria and Galilee, in between homes, in between cities, in between places. They're not welcome anywhere, and most folk wish they would just go away. But because of their condition. Levitical law forbids them from being inside the Jewish city and common sense keeps them out of the Samaritan city. Leprosy, what they had, was a contagious disease at the time which had absolutely no cure. It, it caused skin lesions, it caused boils, it caused bumps, and you had to live with it for the rest of your life. But the problem is, not only were you sick and not only was it obvious, but according to Levitical law, you had to let folk know what was wrong with you. Can, can we be completely honest? There are plenty of us that are suffering and going through, but we ain't going to tell nobody. We're suffering and going through, but we still dress nice. We still get our hair done. We still make sure our nails are dead. We still got our makeup beat. We don't want anybody to know what's going on, and we can hide it because there's nothing that demands that we say it. But Levitical law demanded that those suffering from leprosy for the safety of everyone around them had to let everybody know. Leviticus 13, 45 through 46 outlines what a leper has to do. Look what the Bible says. Now the leper who has sores, his clothes have to be torn, his head has to be bare, and he has to cover his mustache and cry out, 
unclean, unclean, because he shall be unclean. All the days that he has his sores, he will be unclean. And he is unclean and shall dwell alone, and his dwelling shall be outside of the camp. Look what it says. They don't just have a condition. They have to announce their condition and social distance. You know, we've gone through social distancing. We know what it's like to have to stay away from folk, to have to keep our distance from folk. And if we're completely honest, the challenge with social distancing is that we're social creatures. We're social animals. We want to be around folk. We want to be in community. We want to be able to hug somebody. We want to be able to sit down and talk with somebody. But these lepers are having this issue where they can not only can they not be around folk, they have to warn folk to run away from them. They have to warn folk to keep their distance. Can you imagine having to warn folk to stay away from you? But 10 of them come together and form community. Community is important. That's part of why you have to be able, that's part of why you have to come to church. Listen, I love online, but there's something about being able to be in the house of God. There's something about being able to get a holy hug or a healthy handshake or a good old fashioned dap. There's something about community that changes things. So these lepers, they form communities, 10 of them living between Samaria and Galilee. And in the distance, watch this, they see Jesus. Their social distancing, they can't come close. They can't be near him. But they see him in the distance. I want you to understand that if you can still see Jesus, your condition can change. If you can still see Jesus, your problem can be solved. If you can still see Jesus, you can be coming out, not just going through. If you can still see Jesus, there's still a chance. There's still an opportunity. There's still a way out. If you can still see Jesus, I need somebody to understand. If you can see him, he can see you. If you can see him, you still have hope. If you can see him, hold on to your faith because the change might be just around the corner. They can see Jesus, but because of the distance, they've got to get his attention. Bible says they see him and they cry out. They start yelling from a distance with a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. They can't get close. They can't have real access. But from a distance, they're trying to see, can we get him to stop? <laughs> they're trying to see from a distance, can we get him to stop going where he's going and just have a little pity on us? Can I tell you something? The thing I love about the Lord is that no matter what he's doing, if you cry out, he will stop for you. If you cry out, he will incline his ear. Sometimes you are going to have to open your mouth in the midst of your challenge. Open your mouth in the midst of your circumstance. Open your mouth in the midst of your problem and cry out, Lord, save me. Lord, Help me. The lepers couldn't approach Jesus, but they could cry out to get his attention. And here's the good news. Psalm 116 tells us, I love the Lord for he's heard my voice, my appeal for mercy, because he has inclined his ear to hear me. I will call on him as long as I live. I want somebody to know you've gone through for a while, but now it's time to cry out. You've gone through long enough. Now's the time to lift up your voice, shout unto God, and he will stop and incline his ear to hear you and what I love about the Lord is that he's always listening what I love about the Lord is that if you just raise your voice as best you can he will stop in his tracks and listen to you Jesus hears his name and stops and the Bible says he sees them I, I want somebody to know you're seen you're depressed but you're seen. You're lonely, but you're seen. You're struggling, but you're seen. You're frustrated, but you're seen. You're sick, but you're seen. Other folk may not see you, but God sees you. Other folk may not be paying attention, but God is paying attention. There are plenty of people who will see you and ignore you. But what I love about God is that God can't help himself. Other folk will pretend they didn't see you, pretend they can't hear you. But God, when he hears his name, inclines his ear. Because you know how folk are. You know how folk are. You know, I grew up in New York. Y'all know this, I'm a New Yorker. 
And I cannot tell you how many times I have yelled this one word, knowing that I was heard and completely ignored. Taxi! Yeah. Now, see, I grew up before Uber. I grew up before Lyft. I grew up when there was a swarm of these little yellow crazy men driving around and with my brown skin. If I could stand there and yell, taxi! I had to guess, not whether they heard me, but whether they stopped for me. The joy of Jesus is that Jesus is not like a taxi driver. Jesus stops when he hears his name. The Bible says when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Look at what Jesus tells them. Jesus says, go. You moving on from this. I want somebody to know right now the word for you today simply may be go. In that one word go, in that simple statement go, God is opening the windows of heaven, pouring out a blessing. And the blessing is that you are not staying here anymore. You're moving on. The blessing is that no matter how long you've been here, no matter how long you've been going through, no matter how tired you are, no matter how frustrated you are, no matter what you've seen, what you've heard, or how long you've been like this, when he says go, that means you can't stay. And I want somebody to know you can't stay in depression when he says go you can't stay in frustration when he says go you can't stay in the you can't stay falling out when he says go you can't stay impoverished when he says go you can't stay falling down when he says go when he says go that means this season is closed this era is over it's time for you to move forward tells him go because you can't stay here and then he says, show yourselves to the priest. In other words, let them know that you're different now. Beyond that, Levitical law simply said that they needed a certificate of cleanliness issued by a priest so they could regain, re-enter, and re-engage with society. But I want you to know that you may not need a note from the doctor saying that you're okay, but you might have to show some folk that you ain't going through no more. Because here's the problem. When you go through long enough, folk will begin to identify you by your problem, not by your destiny. Folk will buy, identify you through what, by what you're going through, not what you're going to. So you have to go show some folk. I'm not broken anymore. I'm not depressed anymore. I'm not frustrated anymore. I'm not down anymore. I'm going to show you. Because a man named Jesus told me to go. I'm going to show you that I'm different. And watch this. Nothing happened until they went. What? They're still at a distance. They're still far away because they're still unclean. But they've now gotten instruction. And that instruction is go and show yourself. But watch this. The Bible says, and as they went, they were cleansed. Here's the problem. If you don't move, you will stay the same. Too many of us want to change, but we don't want to move. We want a healing, but we don't want to move. We want a breakthrough, but we don't want to move. The Bible says, as they started going, as they started moving, then the change happened. I got a word for somebody today. Get going. I got a word for somebody today. Keep moving. I got a word for somebody today. Put one foot in front of the other and start moving. Because as you start moving, God starts working. As you start moving, God's anointing starts flowing. As you start moving, God's power starts moving. You've got to get moving so that you can get what you've asked for because that's how God delivers. Jesus tells him, go. Show yourself. And as they went, they were healed. As they went, they realized that something had changed. As they went, they're back in the city now because they're healed. They're walking through the streets again because they're healed. They're looking at folks like, ha ha, ha ha, ha ha, ha ha, because they're healed. And that would be a great Miracle story. The only challenge is, that's not where the story 
ends. This would normally be a great miracle story and Jesus would go on to the next thing. They would go on to the next thing and they would live happily ever after. I've noticed in the super majority of miracle stories in the Bible, people are healed and they may praise. They're healed and they may worship, but rarely do they say thank you. That, 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 that's what makes this story different. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice and threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Look at this. I told you that Jesus is walking between Samaria and Galilee. There's Samaritans on one side. They're the people of mixed blood and mixed heritage. There's Galilee on the other side. This is Israel. This is Jewish country. People who are the chosen folk of God. And when you have a problem, you never know who you're going to wind up with. So you got 10 of them living together. Nine of them are Jews. One of them is a Samaritan. And as the Samaritan is gone, he looks and realizes, I'm better. He looks and realizes, I, I don't have leprosy anymore. My, my skin is healed. I, I feel different. I look different. And as he sees it, he says, I got to go back. He worships. He praises. But he also says, thank you. And too many times in life, can I be honest? We don't say thank you enough for the things that people do for us. And if I take it just a step further, it's just rude. Like, who raised you? I mean, right now, my wife and I, we have a six-year-old. He's rambunctious. He's lively. He's always into something. He's always on to something. So we are trying to teach him good manners. So these are the words that we often have to say to Ryan. What do you say? Because when he's asking for something, we want him to say, please. And when he receives something, we want him to say, thank you. That's right. You all know it. The magic words are please and thank you. So we have to prompt Ryan sometimes. Boy, what do you say? And we don't tell him what to say. He just knows that when we say, what do you say? It's either please or thank you. And, and here's the thing. Whenever prompted, he does it until it becomes a habit. I need somebody to understand that sometimes you're going to have to prompt yourself to be grateful, prompt yourself to show gratitude, because you have to get in the habit of doing it until it comes naturally. You have to get in the habit of doing it until you do it without prompting, until you do it without asking, until you do it just because it's what you're supposed to do. And this is what I've noticed with my son. When we give him, Ryan, what do you say? He does three things. He pauses, he returns, and he remembers. I believe it's the same thing that happened with the Samaritan. The first thing you have to do when somebody does something for you is pause. In the pace of the world that we live in, we forget that God doesn't owe us anything. God doesn't have to do what he does. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. We're not entitled to it. And sometimes you need to pause and recognize all that God is doing in your life. Sometimes you need to pause and recognize that he got you up this morning. You need to pause and recognize that it wasn't the alarm clock or the iPhone or the Android that woke you up. God stood at the foot of your bed and blew the breath of life into you one more time. The ruah of life and you awoke. You have to realize that the reason you're still here, the reason you're awake, the reason you're still right side up, the reason you still got a reasonable portion of health and strength is because God has done something for you and you need to pause and realize that every day is a day to thank God. Every day is a day to realize what do you have to say. Every day is a day to realize that God has stopped and climbed his ear and done the miraculous even when you didn't ask. You got to pause and wait just a minute so you can recognize what God is doing. I believe the Samaritan, when he looked at his hands and saw that he was healed, he paused and said, hold on. Do you know how long I was sick? Do you know what I had gone through? Do you know what I had dealt with? I had to pause and just take it all in for a second. 
I would pause and just look around and see that my life is about to be different. Everything's about to be better. I need you sometimes to pause and look around and say, look at what the Lord has done. And once you pause, watch this. You need to return. You need to come back to the source that made it happen. You need to come back to the one who changed your life. You need to come back to the one who healed your body. You need to come back to the one that started you on your way. You got to stop moving so fast away from God that you come back to God so that you can say, thank you, God. And you got to return. The Bible tells in Zechariah chapter one, verse three. Therefore, tell the people. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Some of us, watch this, we're blessed, but we're socially distanced from God. You need to pause, and then you need to come back. You got to come back to the source, come back to the way maker, come back to the miracle worker, come back to the one who's done it all, come back to the one that's made it all okay. You got to come back. To the one who set you free. Come back to the one who's made a way. Come back to the one who straightened out crooked places. Come back to the one that's been there the whole time. Come back to the one who's done it all for you. And then watch this. Once you pause. Once you return. Last thing you got to do is remember. You got to remember how you got over how you made it through, how you came back, and what it was like before. I believe that he came back with worship and praise to say thank you because he remembered it didn't have to be like this. He remembered I didn't have to have a breakthrough. He remembered I didn't have to be healed. And when he remembered, watch this, he remembered who did it. He remembered that he didn't have to do it. But he also remembered, let me show you, that now he's got access. Remember, this all started because they were socially distanced. Jesus walking, they see him and start shouting at him. But they have to do this because they're ritualistically impure, which means that they can't get close to him. But the Samaritan looks up and remembers, watch this, I ain't sick no more, which means I don't have to keep my distance. Because I don't have to keep my distance, I can come back to him. Look what the Bible says. Jesus says, were there not 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Only, has only one return to give praise to God except this only this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise, your faith has made you well. Watch this. The Samaritan, the one of mixed blood, is the one that Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Now, here's the question. If all of them are healed, why has his faith made him well? If all of them have been freed from their leprosy, because there is nothing that says that because they didn't come back and say thank you, that they, did, that they returned to leprosy, because that's not how God works. The gifts of God are without repentance. Once God gives it, God lets you keep it, even if you're ungrateful for it. Ah, but here's the problem. There's always more to the gift that God is giving. And the Samaritan realized that now, because I'm healed, I have access. I don't have to yell from a distance. I can fall down at his feet. I don't have to yell from a distance. I can come back to God. But I, I, because I'm healed, I don't have to yell at a distance. I can praise him right up to his face. I've got access at a level that I did not have before. The other nine just moved on. The other nine just kept going. The last man, he looked around, he paused, he returned, and he remembered, and now he's got access. Well, I want somebody to understand that gratitude is access granted. When you're grateful to God, you can get into God's presence. When you're grateful to God, you can fall down at the throne. When you're grateful to God, God remembers how thankful you were and he gives you a blessing beyond the blessing. Always remember the blessing is not the gift that God gives you. The blessing is the giver of the gift who is God himself. And when you have faith, when you have gratitude, when you will lay it down for the Lord, you've got access 
access granted, access to the throne room of heaven, access to the holy of holies, access to the very face of God, access to the feet of Jesus, access to all that God is doing. I want you to know that if you're going to move forward, you're going to need access because sometimes you're going to get to a place where your education won't get you through, your money won't get you through, your connections won't get you through, but because of God and because of your faith, you'll have access granted. You'll have access to the Holy of Holies, access to the King of Kings, access to the Lord of Lords. No matter what you're going through, God hears you. God will respond to you. God will deliver you. But when you move forward, do it with gratitude. Pause so that you see what God is doing. Remember who did it. Return so that you can say thank you. And when you do, you'll move forward in gratitude because you'll have access granted. Thank you for joining us today. Listen, this is Thanksgiving week and I want you to know that we give thanks for you. We give thanks that you've been watching us. We give thanks that you've joined us today. We give thanks that you heard this word from God. But listen, we'll give thanks if you give your life to God as well. We'll give thanks if you become a member of the St. Paul Church. Listen, you can't get through life on your own. You can't get through your life trying to do it all by yourself. You need access to God and you need a place to be planted. You need community. Today, I want to offer you both. I want to offer you salvation. All you got to do is believe on God. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, then you shall be saved. But you need a church home where you're going and growing in faith. Someplace where you're showing up. Someplace where you find community. Someplace where you're there for people and people are there for you. I want to offer that to you through the St. Paul Church. Listen, if you want to be saved, if you want to make St. Paul your church home, go to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and under contact us, there'll be, in, there'll, be a, there'll be a choice there for you. Listen, you reach out to us, we're going to reach right back out to you, because there's nothing more important to us than your soul's salvation and making sure that you've got a place to call home. Listen, if you're joining us today, it's your first time, thank you for joining us for the first time. If you're a continual person, thank you for coming back every week. Listen, the best way to make sure that you can stay connected to everything is to like, subscribe, hit that bell so that you get notifications. We want you to get every piece of content that we put out because we believe that it will change your life for the better. Listen, if you want to support our work, if you want to support our ministry, we thank you so much for your faithful financial support. To give to the ministry, all you've got to do is go to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and press the Give tab. Once you go there, there'll be multiple ways for you to give. Listen, no gift is too big, no gift is too small. Now's a wonderful time to give your tithe, your offering, or any gift that you want to make unto the church to help us do our ministry and to help us get the word of God out to the people of God all over the world. Thank you again for joining us. It's been, so glad, it's been so good having you with us. Now hang in there for one more minute for the Williams Weekly Challenge. The Word of God tells us not only be hearers of the Word, but also doers of the Word. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I am amazed that it is Thanksgiving week already. You know, Thanksgiving week is the week that we actually take time out to remain and to be and to show our thankfulness and our gratitude. This is something I do every Thanksgiving. I started a tradition of writing a note to somebody who affected my life but doesn't know that they did it. I send them a note of thanks and gratitude so they can know that the small thing that they did had a big impact on me. This week, my challenge to you, thank somebody who doesn't know what they did for you. You'd be amazed at what it will do for them to know how much they did for you. So this week, thank somebody and show them your gratitude so that you can be a blessing to them because they've already blessed you. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you next time.